you, Amit. Happy Halloween, everybody. Amit's intelligence isn't fake, the computer says. Right, so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about computers, a little bit about learning, and uh, a little bit about Harry Potter, if you're paying attention. <laughs> And, uh, and I hope to, to convince you that uh, we can build computers that are really fun to use in a classroom. So I have, I have two daughters. I have a nine-year-old uh, who's in fourth grade and a four-year-old. When the four-year-old was uh, about one, she was just beginning to walk, uh, she went up to the TV screen and she tried to move the pictures on the screen like you would move it on an iPhone. And it didn't move and she was really disappointed. Right. So the, the laugh, uh, the joke wasn't on her. It was actually on us. We uh, we expect uh, kids expect everything to be equally interactive, equally engaging, right? So so today, what I'm going to uh, to spend some time talking about is how do you make computers interactive? How do you how do they get to work with you in a classroom and help you learn, and do so in a in a, in a much more fun way than we've been doing so far. So I want to start with a story. In uh, 1964, before I was born, and I think uh, around the time uh, you, before your parents were born, most likely, uh, there were these two scientists, uh, Arno Penzias and uh, Robert Wilson, who worked at a very famous laboratory out in uh, New Jersey called the Bell Labs. So they built this, they had this, uh, this incredible gizmo, it was a radio telescope, uh, and uh, it, th this was in the early days when they were trying to figure out how to send radio signals out to, uh, to various parts of the world. And these guys were bouncing radio signals off a balloon, and, uh, and they were trying to figure out if they can, they can detect it. And they kept hearing this faint humming, and it would never go away. They were trying to do all kinds of things. They were trying to clean the filters. Uh, they even crawled into the thing and found a pigeon had uh, built a nest. They cleaned it out. Uh, they pointed it at New York City. They pointed it at the sky, and it wasn't going away. Eventually they said, <clears throat> there's something very funny about this, we need to figure out what this is. I don't think it's, it's the instrument, something else happening. So they, they went and talked to uh, a physicist who, who was building models of the universe and they said, look, we have this, this really interesting discovery. What do you think this could be? I think this is coming from the universe itself. So as it turns out, they discovered something extraordinarily profound. They discovered evidence of the Big Bang the Big Bang that happened just when, when time began. And when the Big Bang happened, there was a lot of energy released and they were detecting the remnants of that energy 13.6 billion years later. Um, so, so it's a great example of, uh, of discovery and exploration. And they wouldn't have gotten there unless they were out there exploring in the way that all of you guys do in your daily life. So discovery and exploration, I'll park it out there at, at one corner of the screen, are, are really important. So now I'll tell you a different story. In, in ancient India, uh, you know, we all, we're, we're all growing up in the modern world and we don't actually think back to a time before writing was invented, before people invented how to write. So in ancient India, there was a time before writing was invented when uh, the lessons had to be taught to children. And uh, from generation to generation, we had to educate our kids and pass on all the, the learned uh, knowledge and wisdom and there were these ancient uh, wise men who were doing so. And they were doing so by, uh, what they discovered is that the best way for children to remember something is by telling stories. So they created all these elaborate stories that uh, talked about life and all the important lessons in life. And, and as it turns out, these stories became such a powerful way of learning that they stay to this day. So storytelling is still an extremely important part of who we are as a, as a species. So close up to home, um, before uh, uh, Western settlers settled uh, on these shores in the United States, uh, the Native Indians uh, used to teach mathematics using games. So there was this uh, really cool game, uh, I'm gonna call it counting sticks, uh, where they were taking, uh, where there were basically two players. So one player would take something like 25 sticks, it had to be an odd number, 25 sticks or 49 sticks and he would secretly split them into two nearly equal parts. So if you take 25, he would uh, basically have 20, uh, he would have 13 in one hand and 12 in another hand. And then the second uh, uh, player had to guess which hand had more sticks. So what they were actually discovering is uh, how to do estimation and what odd numbers are and what even numbers are. So game playing uh, from counting sticks to Minecraft that all of you play today is, uh, is an extremely important part of, uh, of learning. 
So finally, uh, when you look at kids, they love, uh, all of you, uh, I have like my nine-year-old daughter, she, ever since she was uh, two, three, four, she wanted to be out there playing around in the environment. Now this is a picture of a huge snowstorm we had a couple of years back. And uh, she was out there, she wanted to be in the storm, feeling it, touching it, figuring out what it feels like to, to, to make a snowman in the, in the middle of the storm. So this whole notion of interacting with the environment using all your senses, right? is so essential to us as a species and, uh, and in terms of how we learn. So all of these things, so storytelling, discovery and exploration, playing games, interacting with, with the environment, these are all pointing to something a little bit bigger, which is if you then add things like uh, how do I personalize something, they're all pointing to engagement. They're all pointing to how we draw engagement in students. Uh, how do I capture your imagination? So in fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how we can put all these together and create the Hermione Grangers of the world. Right, that's the Harry Potter reference. Uh, <laughs> and scientists today, uh, the neuroscientists, there was a wonderful talk just a few minutes ago, neuroscientists today are discovering all kinds of things. That they're discovering for the first time in our history how we really learn, what are our brains made of, what are the wired like, what impacts us, and they might discover some very interesting things. They might discover that video games, far from being a waste of time, are an incredibly powerful way of teaching you guys, right? So, so the, the simple, very simple idea that I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is, uh, can we create very deeply engaging learning experiences? Can we teach uh, using computers and using especially interactivity in computing? So to do that, I'm gonna spend uh, 30 seconds talking a little bit about uh, you know, uh, the history of computers and answer this question, can computers help drive engagement? So way back in, uh, in, in the 1940s, it was very hard to communicate with a computer. You had this elaborate punch card, you were punching all these little holes and feeding this in, and the computers weren't very smart. They were, this guy was probably just doing some simple uh, calculation or some simple addition. And then the PC era, the people invented personal computers. Uh, this is when I was a kid. And, uh, and these things were actually a lot more interactive. You could basically use a mouse, you could play around with things on the pointers, and then people invented laptops. But then the world changed when the iPhone got invented. Suddenly, all of you guys are using computers that are more powerful than supercomputers were in 1980s. And my three-year-old, four-year-old daughter, my eight or four-year-old grandfather, father-in-law, uh, father all of these people could use computers very uh, equally well. And then we started speaking to computers. We could ask computers a question, they could answer questions. Uh, we, uh, IBM invented Watson, uh, which was answering questions. So you could actually interact with the computer using touch and speech and everything else and create this very interesting dynamic between a, a person and a computer. So the question now is how do we put it all together and create a computer that will work with you in a classroom and, and teach you the way you want to learn. If you're interested in science or in sports or in magic, uh, how do I capture your imagination and teach you the way you want to learn? So I'm gonna play a short video right at the end. And uh, in this video, uh, we have the student Carl who loves science and he loves astronomy and he loves stars. Uh, but he's struggling with English because it's not his first language. He's a Spanish speaker. So in this scenario, the computer will work with him, Watson will work with him, and I'll play the video right in the middle and it'll teach him uh, how to uh, make inferences in English uh, using a setting that he's very interested in, which is astronomy. So if you can run the video. An exoplanet, or extrasolar planet, is a planet outside the solar system. Around 1,800 such planets have been discovered thus far. Most of these planets are gas giants like Jupiter. Earth-sized planets are harder to detect due to their relatively small size but astronomers have made progress in finding them. Up to a dozen Earth-sized exoplanets are thought to be prime candidates for the search for extraterrestrial life. This is because these planets are orbiting within their star's habitable zone which allows for the presence of liquid water. Astronomers think there might be at least 400 billion exoplanets in our galaxy alone, which suggests the conditions for life in the universe are more prevalent than previously thought. After reading Carl the passage, Watson asks him a question. Carl is expected to provide a written response in his own words. Watson asks, Based on this passage, why does the author think 
that conditions for life are prevalent in the universe? After pondering the question, which requires Carl to infer his answer from information in different parts of the passage, he responds as follows. The galaxy has over 400 billion planets, so I think it is likely that conditions for life are prevalent. Watson provides feedback. You are only partially correct, Carl. Would you like to review some helpful hints before you try again? Carl agrees. Watson provides Carl with a list of relevant questions it generates, as well as a list of relevant concepts Carl can explore. So, so that was an example of uh, a computer essentially interacting with him and, and trying to teach him uh, without giving him the answer, just allowing him the ability to explore. So the question for you is, uh, would you like computers like this to help you in the classroom, teaching to you the way you want to learn uh, with the topics that you're interested in? And that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.